uh, 2nd October municipal elections in Georgia were indeed hugely visible, uh, visible and attracted uh, a lot of uh, different kind of attention. No surprise. Because of the uh, April 19 agreement and recent political developments in Georgia to be short by these reasons. Okay. Um, we had a European Parliament's uh, delegation as observers in, um, in, in Georgia. I'm very happy. Uh, some of them will join, uh, will join us uh, uh, for this discussion. But, um, you know, uh, observ uh, observing constitutions uh, and observers' uh, evaluation on uh, elections um, were probably following, uh, or generally speaking, uh, uh, could be uh, described as competitive, well organized, but mirrored by widespread allegations uh, of uh, election violations, vote buying, uh, and and level playing field. Of course, misuse of administrative resources very oftenly was uh, mentioned among the features of uh, of uh, uh, these elections as well as uh, intimidation and pressure, different kinds of pressure. And we know that uh, elections is a part of the democratic process, uh, so that's why we are so um, attentively listening and uh, analyzing uh, the results of uh, municipal elections in Georgia. And, um, you know, comments after elections, at least to me, don't bring an impression about uh, decreasing political tensions. I thought that after elections, uh, I will see more happy uh, faces and uh, more conciliation uh, atmosphere, generally speaking. So, with no more cooperative spirit, unfortunately, I think we have to start our discussion uh, in uh, our today's online debate. And... Um, I'm very happy that we have uh, indeed uh, excellent cooperation with the Society of Fair Elections and Democracy, International Society of Fair Elections and Democracy, as well as the Georgian Institute of Politics. And uh, I'm indeed uh, happy to start from the first presentation um, by Nino Dolidze, who is an executive director of International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy. Uh, as understood, Nino will, will have even some presentation uh, to all of us. Nino, uh, so you have 10 minutes, uh, all in all, and the uh, floor is yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me today in this very important discussion. And yes, I will try to sum up uh, what was the results based on our monitoring of our municipal elections. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, these elections, besides that it was municipal elections, it was very highly covered by international partners of Georgia, because this was not ordinary municipal elections, but after our political crisis, it was very much needed your support, but also it was very important elections for Georgia. So I will share my presentation in order to like uh, fully present uh, what I would like to show. Uh, just a second, technical. So I hope you see the presentation. Um, so uh, not yet, you know, not yet. No? Now it's coming. Yes, now it's good. Okay. So uh, I would just like to mention that whenever assessing elections in Georgia and elsewhere, it's very important to cover the whole procedures and whole process of elections. So when talking about election dates procedures, we of course consider how was the pre-election environment because pre-election period really defines the results what we get on election day. That's why our organization, ISPED, is, which is key watchdog organizations uh, of elections in Georgia, started monitoring of elections much earlier, from June 1st, and we had our 71 long-term observers during pre-election period. And uh, as for assessing the pre-election environment in the country, we can say, as you mentioned, that all parties were able to run the election campaign, but the ruling party enjoyed a greater advantage due to the mobilization of administrative and financial resources. 
Also, pre-election environment was harmed by the cases of political pressure, threats, as well as political dismissal of people and ineffective investigation of such cases by relevant state agencies. So when we are talking about the pre-election environment, we should mention that really in this uh, period what we covered, we have seen use of administrative resources, the blurred line between government and the ruling party, and unfortunately we had cases of political pressure, threats, and uh, dismissal based on the political ground. So of course it damaged damaged our, our pre-election environment and also of course it's like uh, affected on election day because when we are talking about free and fair elections we should be sure that the people of Georgia voters really vote freely on election day. That's why talking about election day uh, itself was defined by the pre-election findings and now I want to talk about election day mostly because you all have seen what was our and international organizations assessment of pre-election environment. So for election day, ISFED had 1,121 1, static observers throughout the country uh, and we had chosen polling station based on the representative sample in order to give statistical information about the election day. Because when we are talking about violation, we should be knowing whether it's isolated cases or it's widespread throughout the country. That's why we had statistical sample for Tbilisi and nationwide. And plus for these elections, ISFED had the novelty, which was statistical sample also covering outside polling station perimeters. We also had again mobile groups who was covering the whole country and all this information was coming to ISFED database and ISFED monitoring center and we were checking the whole election day procedures as well as ISFED had PVT to count and tabulate results was what we were receiving during the day from the proportional nationwide but also of Tbilisi mayoral races. So key findings what we have covered during the election day can be like divided into two parts. One is elections administered within the polling station and second is uh, absolutely different findings outside the polling stations and I will try to distinguish what was like differences in this um, inside polling stations and outside. As for inside findings, we can say that the uh, like voting process across the country was on the whole conducted in a peaceful environment in line with the legal requirements. However, certain trends negatively affected the electoral environment. Inside polling stations, ISFED recorded violations of the secrecy of the ballot, tracking of voters by unauthorized persons voting with improper voter identification documents, allowing voters to cast a ballot without checking ink or without doing ink, which is violation of legislation in Georgia. Also, ISFED observers reported cases of violations of procedural list of handing out ballot papers. And uh, we had cases, multiple cases, when now uh, we had ISFED observer kicked out from the polling station or violation of monitoring um, during the day. Uh, so this was inside. But when we are talking about the outside environment, the environment outside polling stations was problematic, much more problematic than inside, because there, case, there were cases of voter mobilization tracking of the voters by unauthorized or strange people. And we have also um, identified and monitored alleged vote buying cases. When people were given money outside the polling stations, we had seven cases of that. Um, the voters were given money to, uh, before entering the polling stations. So we, uh, ISFED observers, uh, have uh, observed the presence of party uh, coordinators representatives of certain organizations not knowing not knowing who these organizations are and unidentified individuals near polling stations uh, within and beyond 100 meters and why I am saying with 100 meters it's very important because according to the agreement which was um, like mediated by, by you and Charles Michel we had electoral reform and based on the electoral reform 100 perimeter covering was prohibited around the polling station. 
And this was because in previous elections, we have seen people standing out the polling station and tracking voters who was going and who was not. And we have seen and uh, we have considered it is um, like uh, controlling the free view of voters whenever somebody is looking who came and who didn't came and then they were tracking. So purpose of this electoral reform, uh, re re amendment and putting 100 meter prohibition was really because of that. But unfortunately, political parties, their representatives continued for this election the same way governing around the polling station and controlling the will of voters. So as I said, we had statistical observation, and um, so I can tell you what was the statistics. For example, suspicious gathering of persons with the perimeter of 100 meters of the polling stations was reported 20% 20 20 of the polling stations which, which we covered within 100 perimeter. But besides 100 perimeter, we also had 10% their suspicious gathering of persons were reported. So also, we, uh, we have uh, observed, as I mentioned, tracking of voters, putting marks next to the voter names, indicated which voters has cast their votes. And we have seen this in 11.7% of the polling station outside what we have covered, which is again a very high number when you see that at 11% of the polling station, someone is standing outside and tracking who came or who didn't. Also, at 8% of the outside of polling station, uh, ISVET observers reported verbal, verbal confrontation or harassment, and pressure of threats out, outside the polling uh, pieces were reported at 8%, as I mentioned. At this, um, uh, during this uh, election day, when we were observing these cases outside, we were, of course, of course calling to, to the patrol police because according to the legislation, they should be uh, dealing with this problem. So we have seen that in 60% uh, of the polling station, police was mobil mobilized near the polling stations. So we have also observed campaign materials within the polling stations, next to the polling station. And the, here are the uh, like um, visualization what, with the same numbers, what we have observed, 20% uh, uh, outside mobilization, 11% uh, tracking of voters. And also what is uh, very important, we have seen in 22% organized and systemic mobilization of voters in transportation of them with the same cars. Uh, so this was also problematic during many years, then people were brought with the same cars and sometimes we think that it might be doubtful if these people are bring to the different polling, different polling station if there is carousel voting or not. So in general to assess election day, we can say that inside polling station procedures were mostly followed, but outside uh, we had seen these problems when we think that it was uh, like controlling the free will of voters by standing outside, by tracking voters, or by uh, organize, uh, organizing this transportation for them. Um, ISVET was also, of course, uh, conducting parallel tabulation, which I mentioned, and according to our parallel tabulation, the results, what we got, uh, was uh, in accordance, accordance to the Central Election Commission, and mostly we have the same results for the national proportional results. You can see that Georgian Dream got, according to ISVET, parallel vote tabulation, 46.6%, United National Movement, 31%, uh, Kaharia's party uh, for Georgia 7.7 .7, and then rest of them you can see here uh, on our um, presentation. We, uh, we also covered proportional results for Tbilisi and in Tbilisi we have seen that uh, both uh, uh, Georgian Dream and UNM have got less than nationwide. So here we have seen that uh, Georgian Dream has 39% uh, in Tbilisi proportional, United National Movement 28, uh, uh, for Georgia 8. Then in Tbilisi, many other smaller parties also got uh, uh, more than 1%, which is different new political parties arose in this uh, like uh, one year. 
Uh, and we had uh, also mayoral races. Um, and mayoral races is here. You can see that Kaha Kalate got 45%, and Nikamelia 34%, Yorga Haria 9%, and for sure, of course, we have uh, in Tbilisi second round. And not only in Tbilisi, in all local self governing uh, cities of Tbilisi, which is five, of Georgia, which is five plus 15 in other municipalities. In total, in 20 um, uh, cities, we have second rounds, which will be held uh, in October 30th. And also, uh, just uh, I want to um, underline the situation after uh, closing and uh, counting procedures. Again, like we had during last elections, unfortunately, we are seeing quite high number of misbalances uh, in the protocols. We are seeing uh, these balances uh, like plus and minus, which means that we have seen like uh, we have seen more ballot papers than registered voters in the uh, voters list or less ballot papers coming out from the booth uh, like box than signatures of, uh, of uh, the uh, voters in the uh, voters list. So this anomaly still continues like it was during previous elections. And this Fed had submitted around 350 complaints, more than 350 complaints in total. And many of them are related to the vote count procedures and of these protocols. So at the moment, like now we are in the process of submitting like electoral disputes in general, we have submitted complaints in mostly all of the districts and we are asking district election commissions to make recounts in those polling stations where, where we have high number of um, disbalances in uh, protocols and where we think that it's not only technical error problem, problem, but it's like very doubtful when you see 100 ballot paper difference or 70 or 80. So now we are asking recounts. It is very uh, interesting what will be the answer from the election administration, because in order to uh, like increase trust towards uh, election administration and to trust the results, I think it's very important now if they um, answer to our complaints and uh, recount all this polling station, which we are asking. Also, besides uh, recounts, ISFED is asking annulment of free polling station um, of uh, two in Marneuli and one in Zugdidi because election procedures during the day in these polling stations were so violent that we do not um, uh, agree the results, like we do not trust the results what could be um, counted in this polling station. So now it's very important what will be these complaints and appeals, how it will change mm, uh, if this uh, like uh, these balances change votes uh, minorly or it will be big changes. And then afterwards we can do the full assessment of uh, the conduction of elections in Georgia. So this is very shortly, but of course I'm ready to answer your questions anytime because uh, we are still in the process of uh, like uh, monitoring elections and it's not over and of course it will be very interesting how what will be the pre-election environment before second rounds because for example today we have already heard that uh Kaladze, who is uh, running in the second round that he already announced uh, some uh, like uh, promises that business will be freed uh, uh, with different types of taxes, what we, they have to pay for 2021 or 2022. So it's very important if uh, that government, like ruling party candidates, do not use administrative resources before the second rounds. Uh, again, this is very shortly, uh, and I am ready to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, Nino. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Definitely, we'll be given uh, more questions after. Corneli Kakacha, who is a director of the Georgian Institute of Politics, will make a presentation. Uh, Corneli, floor is yours. Again, 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Um, just, I would like to continue what Nino was basically saying without the sheet language that very well described uh, what was the environment and uh, what kind of, uh, you know, like results we had after election. So I will try a little bit, like, a uh, little bit pinpoint uh, and highlight a little bit uh, uh, some major, I would say, findings after this election or uh, some sort of some shorter analysis about uh, this way actually this election brings to Georgia. And here I have a, uh, two news, as always, in classical terms, good and bad news. 
The bad news is that um, if the, um, there was expectation in international community that this election will solve somehow Georgian crisis or uh, something at least mitigate this, I think it didn't really happen because and it was kind of expected because um, this election, even though opposition was trying to uh, to show it as a kind of like a referendum uh, for regime change, it actually didn't happen, as we can see from the results. So in that sense, um, it didn't solve the major problem in the country because uh, basically, as we know, uh, the current government is uh, um, is trying to uh, to hold the power at any expense and. Uh, uh, I think uh, we already know that uh, you know where this uh, leads to the country, and we know the statement from different international actors, including the EU uh, and other uh, you know like the strategic friends of Georgia. So basically, um, it means that uh, crisis is not over. So we might uh, um, we might expect that this crisis maybe even uh, go to a little bit. Uh, deeper. Um, the one thing is that uh, if there was expectation this the so-called polarization, and I will explain you why I call it so-called polarization later, uh, it uh, it even deepened and especially after the arrival of Mr. Saakashvili in Georgia and uh, uh, now he's um, you know presence in the um, in the prison it's a, it's a huge headache uh, for a uh, ruling party. Uh, it's like a kind of hot potato. You kind of don't know what to do with this. And uh, I, I think that this is another issue uh, we will have there uh, for some time there. But uh, I think that one of the uh, biggest uh, problem also was that, uh, um, you know, that uh, one of the biggest results also was that uh, uh, after the arrival of Saakashvili, which was quite, um, actually influenced this uh, results of election and smaller parties like Akharia's party and some other parties who were expected to gain a little bit more, they actually um, uh, you know, lost some percentage. Uh, and um, again, we have this, this classical game GD versus uh, UNM. And this is where we stayed and uh, we cannot get out, uh, get, get rid of this situation almost like the last 10 uh, or eight years, uh, I would say. And uh, 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 and this uh, polarization, which uh, which we talk about, it's uh, in fact I think um, it's not a polarization in a classical sense like we have in Western countries, where we have a ideological polarization, left uh, versus uh, you know like right or uh, uh, liberals versus uh, I don't know uh, some other you know like uh, um, ideologies. But in reality, we have a um, I would say extreme. Uh, for extreme partisanship, uh, which is actually geared along the two persons, uh, Vidina Ivanishvili versus Mikhail Saakashvili. And basically, this is this drives the Georgian politics uh, for last uh, decades, I would say. And I think this is very unfortunate case, especially for the country, which actually needs uh, uh, more, uh, how to say, to, to, uh, to strengthen the institutions and not the uh, you know, personalities. And, I think in that sense, uh, we don't see that there's a major changes after this election. The good thing about uh, this election is that what we see that um, at least, uh, um, you know, that um, uh, opposition and also Georgian society, which is very important, now kind of felt, especially in the regions, and this is a very important message, that they actually can challenge the ruling party, even though what Nino mentioned here, there was a lot of uh, how to say uh, irregularities there, um, to say it mildly, uh, and uh, some other issues. Uh, some uh, regions uh, of Georgia actually opposition managed to garner, uh, you know, um, I would say enough votes. So uh, of course there is a second round of the um, elections, and we don't know how this will end up. But it's already clear that Georgian society uh, wants to change something, and they first time they uh, felt that. Actually, through the ballots, you can make the changes, especially in the regions, because um, the regions are more, I would say, um, how to say, prone to uh, vote normally for government. And I think this changed at least several regions. Same thing I would say in Tbilisi. It's kind of clear that, um, you know, like uh, uh, Tbilisi is a, I would say, um, a big supporter of the opposition, though we also have the, uh, some fragmentation, as, the, in, as we always had in, among the Georgian opposition. Um, so um, it, uh, it's uh, Georgian uh, public actually uh, expects that there will be within this vote uh, there will be diversity in, uh, in especially in 
local municipalities. And some municipalities, some cooperation and building of alliances is, is inevitable. But I don't know how that will work because we already know very toxic relations between UNMGD. And I don't know how that will work because we are very far from that model. But at least, um, uh, and this is a very important, that if there will be at least attempts from other opposition parties to at least to form smaller coalition, that will be very important uh, you know, precedent for Georgian history. Because as you know, Georgia doesn't have a, uh, much tradition of the coalition government or uh, to building the coalitions uh, last 30 years. And if uh, that will happen, I think that will be a very strong message to to Georgians who actually fear uh, that if they vote against government and they don't want to end up with the same situation like we've been last 30 years when we are voting for one regime and then we're getting another, um, you know, like a one party dominance uh, in the country. So in order to do that, I think this, um, uh, this um, I would say, we need some sort of case study. And this is a very good time now for opposition to show the maturity. And I understand that nobody expects them to become suddenly, you know, like uh, friends and uh, something, but they should um, actually cooperate. And we will see how this will work. What, is, what was missing in this election, and that's very unfortunate, and you can see this from uh, OEC ODIR reports and some other statements there, that it, it, it was not actually about local issues. So. It was anything but uh, a new, uh, you know, like the discussion and the so-called debates, which we also had, that was not something which a Georgian public expected. And unfortunately, I must uh, say that Georgian public recently, um, uh, public grew, actually, and their expectations, be, uh, their expectations is a little bit higher. And political class, unfortunately, cannot really follow this suit. And uh, I think this is very unfortunate case because Georgian public deserves issue-based discussion about issues. And if you look this NDI area polls, uh, uh, recent polls, uh, we all, all, of it all know actually what, what people want to hear and what they want to discuss. And this is, uh, you know, jobs, unemployment, uh, social issues, uh, uh, many other. And unfortunately, this election was not used, at least first round, unfortunately, was not there even uh, among the mayoral candidates in Tbilisi. So, and uh, I, I think that, that that's a major, I would say, shortcoming, and it just shows how shallow uh, uh, we have uh, the political agenda, how shallow was it this election. So I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, generally, uh, this situation, uh, um, I would say, a little bit complicates Georgia's uh, consolidation of the, in Georgia consolidation of democracy. and. Uh, we, of course, know that uh, Georgia is aspiring democracy and then nobody expects that there will be some transformation uh, overnight or after this election. But what we see, unfortunately, that Georgia, this election showed that Georgia didn't really progress in terms of election and uh, election conduct. And I'm sure some other speakers we have here uh, today, they will uh, talk about this more. And, uh, and the, uh, when, what, what is important is that we see that um, uh, we were talking last, um, I would say, two years or three years about the backsliding of Georgian democracy. Unfortunately, I think we should really um, uh, stop to uh, talk about that because I, what is happening now in the country, it's not the backsliding. I think it's a movement towards a kind of soft uh, authoritarianism. And I think this is a very bad signal for, for Georgia's friends uh, in Europe and uh, elsewhere. And, of course, I understand that um, you know international partners are here to help Georgia, and we really appreciate that. But I still believe, and I said it many times in other occasions, that uh, all these problems which uh, which were created by Georgian political elites, this must be solved by uh, Georgians uh, itself and by ourselves. And I think that inability of the political class to to talk to each other and uh, and to somehow to mitigate this disagreement, uh, I, I think this is a huge problem here and I hope that uh, all this um, and I know that there's a lot of other um, ideas in European Parliament in, in, including Jean Monnet dialogue and some other things and uh, I know that this recent event didn't really uh, help uh, to, to start this project but I think this is very important for a country like Georgia because uh, um, you know we again uh, this uh, I'm still believe that Georgian problems should be solved uh, by Georgian political elites but of course international partners they can help they can assist uh, but there should not be expectation like we have now among the Georgian politicians that 
uh, you know, like the, all these problems which they created should be solved either in Brussels or Washington DC. This is not going to happen. And at the end of the day, we should not forget that Georgia is a small country and that we are not in the center of the world's attention all the time. And I already, from some conversations, uh, what I'm hearing uh, more and more, there's a more uh, so-called Georgian fatigue. So I think that uh, Georgian political class, Georgian society, including civil society, academic, um, you know, circles, we should really worry about this and we should really try to push uh, political class to somehow um, to resolve this crisis in uh, in maybe sh not a short term, but in mid -term, uh, in medium term. And um, uh, I think uh, there's uh, some role here for um, for other actors as well, uh, international actors. But uh, in general, as I said, this is a homework we should really be doing ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Corneli. Thank you indeed for your comments and a very interesting uh, insights uh, from the elections. Now we <clears throat> turn to our two colleagues uh, who've been observing elections from uh, on behalf of the European Parliament. And beforehand, uh, those who follow us uh, online uh, um, on this debate, please uh, use uh, chat or Facebook um, 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 in order to present your question. If you wish, I mean, to, you can indicate uh, the person uh, you, you might ask for, or, I mean, general question might be presented and then we will make it uh, heard to everybody. I see that uh, uh, for the time of being, I have uh, Marina Kayurant uh, from SND. She is um, a very active person on Georgia as well as chair of the European Parliament's EU Georgia Parliamentary Association. And Marina was in, in Georgia to observe the municipal elections. Marina, what are your uh, impressions? What are um, your observations uh, from the ground uh, once you've been back uh, from Georgia and, and now you have a possibility to make it uh, uh, public? Thank you, Marina. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Petras. Uh, first of all, thank you for putting up today's discussion and also thank you, Nino and Corneli, for your inputs. Because yes, we might observe, we might be very much interested in what's happening in Georgia, but in the end, we are grateful to the information that we receive from people who are on the ground, who work on a daily basis in Georgia. So that's why your inputs are of, uh, uh, of a great value. Uh, yes, the EP delegation was observing elections. Doesn't happen often that European Parliament sends observers for local elections, but it was discussed already what was the reason, and I'm really happy that we went. Because it was important also as a symbol, also as a sign. Uh, I was observing uh, elections in uh, Tbilisi. My colleagues were also outside, and I personally visited together with my colleagues in Tbilisi 13 uh, polling stations, and I think the, also a big value for me was to see and to talk to Georgian people. Uh, I, I still speak Russian, I speak English, so it was pretty easy for me to talk to people with younger generation in English, with older generation in Russian. And what I heard from all of them is very strong support to the EU and people were tired of political fights within the country. They wanted the country to start working finally on the questions that were in front of every government, that are in front of every government today, being it COVID pandemic, economy, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's the very general observation. We were part of a dear mission. So, of course, no question, we share all the preliminary conclusions that were made by ODIR. And uh, our chairperson, uh, Michael Galler, I hope that he will be joining us at some point, but Michael uh, already issued a statement on behalf of all of, uh, all of us where we repeated Odir's evaluation and also recognized that the elections were, uh, were organized in a well-organized manner. I very much agree with what Nino said. It's not only the 2nd of October, it's also the pre-election period, it's campaigning period, it's the deeply polarized political situation, but also deeply polarized media. 
what has been in Georgia, let's say, uh, especially especially very very visible since parliamentary elections of the last year. So that was the environment. We were there for election day, which means that for us to make any conclusions about the pre-election situation, of course we we did, but we relied very much on the uh, observers of ODIR and also uh, Council of Europe who was there for a longer time and had better chance to, to see what was happening on the ground. Uh, today, what I, what I think is important is how the Georgian authorities will handle those complaints and those violations that their attention was drawn to. It will be a very clear signal. Of, of course, the violations are different. No, one of them was, I don't know, Kaha Kuchava entering polling station with a mask, with a number. Well, I don't know how serious violation that is, because anyway, he's number one, two or three of Georgian Dream. Everybody knows he's Georgian Dream. But there were, of course, maybe some, uh, some more, much more serious violations. And now it's up to the Georgian authorities to give a very thorough investigation into those and answer. That's what international community, that's what we are waiting for. For us, it will be also part of the electoral process and elections. Uh, now, to, now, now as to the, to, the, to the future. Yes, I agree also with, uh, I think uh, Corneli mentioned that in the recent, but also Nino mentioned, that in the recent year, we have seen a couple of steps that raise questions and that the uh, EU has been reacting, that also me in, as the chair of the South Caucasus delegation, I have expressed my regret. It's the Georgian dream leaving the 19th of April agreement, but it's also the violation uh, or the, 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 uh, the using of force on the 5th of July against journalists, but it's, much, it's a much wider question. It's also the question of freedom and uh, of uh, LGBTI community. Uh, Georgian authorities are refusing uh, financing from the EU, which is speculated because they were not sure that they will get the microfinancing. Uh, some reforms are still in the process, and although Georgian Dream uh, left April 19th agreement, we do expect them to fulfill all the points of the Charles Michel negotiation agreement. That's something that we're really looking for, and as we all know, the deadline for judicial, for judicial reform is spring next uh, year, so it will be a way to see how Georgian democracy will work. Very much agree with uh, Corneli that EU will not solve Georgian internal problems. I was also asked in the streets, uh, EU had very strong stance with uh, Charles Michel. Are you going to come again if we're going to have a problem? Of course, I can't speak on behalf of high officials of the EU, but my gut's feeling is no. We tried it once. We did our best. Our mediation is on the table, but now it's up to Georgian political forces to be above their short-term party interests and to start looking at the national interests of Georgia. So at the moment, I'm, I, I want to be optimistic, and I am optimistic in seeing the second round, but also I want to see how the parliament will start to work with opposition. I just do not see that there is any way for Georgia democratic reforms, European integration, if there is no workable parliament. Workable parliament means also including opposition. Because one of the next steps we're looking for is division of powers within the parliament, which has been also uh, waiting for the uh, local elections. So I think maybe the local elections took down the pressure for snap elections. And it is a chance to come together and to start working together in the parliament. Because the next parliamentary elections are in 2024, yeah? We are almost already in 2022. So come on, guys. We are already in the next pre-electoral phase pretty soon. 
So it's time to come together, look into what has to be done at the moment in Georgia, and I'm looking at both Georgian Dream and opposition parties to overcome the political hatred and the, the short-term interests and to put their national interests above. Uh, I also have to admit that uh, uh, very many people were talking about coalition government. Uh, uh, Georgian president has made it, has uh, st stated it publicly. So yes, I also agree that it might be a time for start looking into coalition cooperation, if not coalition government at the moment, because they, the, the parliamentary elections will take place in 2024, but at least to start working with other political parties, not pro forma, but on substance. And my very final comment is that yes, European Parliament has offered uh, Jean Monnet mediation for Georgian Parliament. So let's see how will be the second round. And after that, we can come to that question. I hope the second round will be peaceful. I hope that there will be there is not going to be violation in the streets or, or use of force in the streets. And of course, we will be monitoring very closely uh, what will happen to Mikhail Saakashvili. Georgia is, Georgia is a democracy. We are not interfering into Georgian domestic affairs, but of course we will see that the rule of law and all the judiciary principles will be fulfilled by the Georgian authorities. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you for your uh, excellent uh, uh, statement. Uh, with many uh, lines, I think all those uh, Brussels 7 might agree. I mean, those uh, maps who uh, uh, unofficially uh, representing political parties uh, been behind this uh, April 19 agreement. So your assessments are very, very correct. Uh, look, uh, uh, not uh, wasting time, I, I, I have some uh, questions uh, which might uh, uh, be interesting for our audience. Firstly, uh, what uh, should we expect uh, in the second uh, round of elections? How many those second rounds uh, will be in Georgia? Uh, all in all, uh, all in all. Uh, again, will opposition parties, you think, be united in in supporting uh, for their candidate? Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, how much the opposition learned from uh, from the first round and um, is willing to cooperate? And what are your uh, you know and um, Corneli expectations for election campaign? recommendations for international observers uh, and what are the possibilities to decrease polarization in this regard? Is there a possibility for uh, that Georgia Dream and UNM will, uh, uh, will, uh, will have a kind of compromise in, in this regard? So it's about polarization, a recent one. Or is the possibility of new, real and strong political party? Who knows? Uh, which might, uh, which could uh, change the political uh, field in Georgia. So uh, that's that's the question. And um, uh, again, the general question is uh, to probably all of us: uh, what should be uh, what should be done uh, in in Georgia to change the overall, let's say, uh, politics or quality of politics in Georgia? What uh, would be the priority? Uh, uh, fields and uh, issues in, in this regard. Many, many questions, but uh, let's start pro probably from Corneli now and then, you know. Corneli. Okay. Let me start with the first question. Uh, uh, what to expect, I mean, to, from the second round of elections and uh, whether opposition will be able to unite. Uh, I think in general, opposition likely to be united, except uh, maybe Gaharia's party, not maybe, but I think this is like what we hear uh, from his statement. Uh, and uh, it uh, appears that um, it's kind of identity issues for him because if he will uh, side with opposition or uh, with Georgian Dream, uh, he may lose his um, a, a party identity. So that's why uh, this party is a little bit in um, how to say a little bit in a delicate situation. Uh, I think that the other political parties, I think they will try, and I'm sure that there is already some agreement and. Uh, there will be uh, some sort of unity there, um, at least in second round, and we will see what 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 will can, uh, what will will be the result. But in general, I just want you to somehow to warn you that um, if you look to the Georgian election second round, unfortunately, last thirty years, 
it was mostly the ruling party who was uh, actually winning in majoritarian seats, especially because, you know, uh, they have a lot of other, uh, you know, resources, including administrative resources, uh, how to manipulate this uh, second round. So, but we will see, because, you know, Georgian society also shown that, you know, there is a resistance. So we will see in some regions it might be very difficult, but in general, that's the kind of story. About the second question, um, you know, if there will be, um, you know, like um, if GD and UNM can compromise Unfortunately, I have to be very, um, how to say, I'm not optimi optimistic about this because the toxic relations, the two leaders uh, um, of this, uh, or un unofficial leaders of these parties actually, have with each other, doesn't allow that. And uh, uh, I think that one of the biggest problem, and this also brings us to this third question, some part of the third question which was asked, what the international society should do that, one of the biggest problems is that I know that there was a lot of um, uh, international uh, help uh, to Georgian political parties last uh, uh, 30 years since independence by from United States, from European Union, but uh, most of them they were addressed with some other issues including party building and things, but there was some uh, important issue was missing. Basically what we need to do and I strongly believe that we need to introduce uh, some sort of concept of uh, um, how to say, coalition uh, building and trust and some other things, which is very important for a country like Georgia. And as I said, we don't have this tradition of the coalition government. And I think we really need to invest, especially young people, young leaders. And uh, since our my organization is working with them, we already know. And the good thing is that um, some of our alumni is actually, they joined the uh, new parties recently. and. There was uh, one case when our two alumni, they were belonging to different camps, but they, uh, and they were debating, and, but their debate was a little bit different. And this is a new generation of Georgian politicians. And I really hope that, I, I, I don't know about what we can do with the other politicians, but uh, I think that with younger generation, with young politicians, we really need to, need to, do, to work on this. And I'm sure uh, this will bear some fruit, but of course, it's... Uh, you should not expect that um, some change is overnight because this is a long process and it's part of the political culture. And as you know, it's, you cannot really expect to, to have some, uh, some changes. But and I think that um, um, as far as the third parties, it's very difficult. You know, everybody was expecting and there was even talk about the so-called third forces. And we have in even this election, you know, the one party whose name actually was third. Uh, force, but unfortunately they didn't really make so. so it just to have a name third force doesn't mean anything in Georgia. So you have to. Um, uh, it, it's not easy also for a new parties to emerge and to be challenger for this big. Um, uh, I, I would say big party. So uh, in that sense, we don't know how that will work uh, in the future. But uh, as far as the what Georgian society should do, I think uh, together with the international community. Uh, we have to really work and to, as a um, voters, uh, as a normal, uh, ordinary citizens, we have to push the Georgian political class to uh, for compromise. I mean, for more compromise from politics. And I know that you know. Uh, I think everybody knows, and uh, we heard a lot of statements even from uh, President Charles Michel and uh, from other officials that this is the, um, the this not the strongest uh, part of Georgian politics. So. We need to push uh, and to somehow realize, to make realization that, you know, that compromise is not a weakness. Uh, and I think we are not there yet, but I think that part of the Georgian society, where should we do is that as a voters, we should really demand more. We should be more demanding, especially like, um, like I mentioned, during this election, we didn't hear any issue-based debates. Is that uh, only because of the politicians? We should not allow that kind of discussion. And here, the media also, Georgian media also has a role because they should really, uh, you know, put uh, um, in a for format that, that does, will not allow the politicians to talk uh, what they want to talk or to 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 have personal attacks, but to to be on to to have to start this uh, some sort of issue-based policies. I think this is what the country needs, and this is also the expectation from international community. Thank you, Corneli. Uh, you know, uh, you can continue. There is one more um, uh, clarification uh, 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 asking. Uh, is that possible that Gaharia uh, for Georgia party might support uh, coalition candidates? Uh, Corneli yeah. already mentioned this, but you know, I ask you to be as precise as possible, two, three minutes, because there are more questions to, uh, to come. Yes. 
Uh, thank you. So uh, there was a question about how many uh, second round runoffs we will have. We have 20 runoffs for the mayoral races and we have a uh, rest for the majority districts. This is bigger amount, amount of numbers, but we cannot exactly say because there is still counting procedures. So here, what I would like to say that it's ma mainly uh, between the government and UNM, the candidates, what we see in these 20 mayoral races are mostly between uh, like these two big parties. And in those municipalities, which is not UNM directly, it is supported by the United Opposition, I would say. So here we can really say that uh, mostly opposition will be unified with the opposition candidates, except Gaharia, because Gaharia already mentioned that he will not pressure his voters to whom to vote. So we do not know, uh, because officially he is not supporting any side. He, he said he's uh, whoever you want to vote, but he will not pressure them. Uh, so. Uh, there was a question about uh, the, what should Georgia do and also international partners should be doing. I totally agree with Corneli that our political elite should know, like learn dialogue, should know how to compromise and move to issue-based politics. People, voters of Georgia, because voters of Georgia, basic the polling, they are expecting part of parties to be talking on the issues, but these parties are not. So maybe for the second round, there should be a recommendation for parties and candidates to campaign based on the issues. This is, this is very important for the second round. But then later, we should work with the political parties. And also, we should work with the voters for maybe voter education, how not to be pressured by, by any of the party, etc. So this is very general. But then I will I receive other questions. Thank you. Um, there have been... Uh... Two maybe uh, questions from my side, and I want to ask very, very shortly, starting from uh, Marina. Marina, what, what is your opinion? What the impact was of COVID uh, pandemia? I mean, you, you met with people. I mean, you saw the environment. Uh, I mean, maybe you have some uh, uh, observations in this regard. And what kind of the impact uh, Mikhail Saakashvili return made on the results of the elections? Can, starting from you, then to Nino and to Corneli, uh, uh, we expect uh, your uh, replies. Thank you. Marina? Uh, uh, first of all, the voter turnout was higher than during the previous local elections, which means that the COVID, uh, uh, COVID situation was taken seriously, but there were uh, circumstances that, that uh, led people to come to the polling stations. In the polling stations, uh, I would say that everyone was wearing masks, that was correct, but of course uh, some rooms were overcrowded. So I'd say that uh, the principle of 2 plus 2 or 1.5 uh, 1 was not always uh, everywhere observed. But the overall impression on the polling day, on the election day, was rather positive. Now on Sarkashvili, uh, I, well, I'd like to make it very clear that, uh, that when Sarkashvili returned to Georgia, he violated Georgian laws, which means that... Uh, he will be also accountable for illegal enter into the country. Uh, does it have? Th does his entrance have an impact on the elections? Most probably, yes. How much and on which party? That's definitely more question to Cornelia and Nino who knew the situation better. But what I observed, uh, uh, Sakashvili called for people to come to the Rustaveli Avenue tens of hundred thousands to come there and to express their will. People did not. And for me, it was a signal that Saakashvili has lost such a power and political power that he had before in the country, or at least at the moment, he could not talk to the people the way he used to do. And it's a very big question now to UNM. What is the future of UNM? Are they with Saakashvili? Are they uh, next? To Saakashvili, are they without Saakashvili? So for me, it's also interesting to see what will happen with that. Thank you. Thank you. Nino and Corneli, can, can you reply shortly? Because I see that uh, uh, our colleague Michael Gala, uh, Michael Gala joined us, and uh, I still want uh, uh, to hear his assessment as well. I think we, we can listen to the um, Michael Gahler and they, because okay. he's... Yeah. Excellent. Michael, uh, you are most welcome to join. I know, I mean, you, you've been busy with other things. Uh, look, you have uh, two, three minutes. I mean, 
most yes. important as as you are strategically thinking uh, man i mean your observations and takes uh, from uh, the elections michael sorry it was my mistake i technically simply did not manage to enter with this and uh, that's why i'm so late um well uh, the most important things uh, first of all it was good to have a higher turnout uh, uh, we all witnessed that te the technicalities on election day went rough, fairly well. That was not the problem. Also, not the the, the uh, improvements uh, in the technical preparations. But uh, uh, we witnessed, indeed, uh, be it looking through the city, there was no level playing field. There was clearly a dominance of the ruling party, also making use of their. Uh, administrative resources and uh, um, in so far uh, it was uh, um, as it was, as we described uh, uh, in our uh, in our preliminary statement which we fully share I think um, what is uh, important now is uh, first of all to see of course that the um, second round in the in the cities where there is a second round uh, uh, goes well uh, but the parties should draw the consequences uh, and uh, still uh, apply what we have said, uh, the substance of our 19th April agreement. And that goes together with previous, um, with previous commitments. I mean, it's not new to say that the judiciary must be reformed. It is definitely important to, to uh, respect what the, uh, uh, to implement what, for instance, the Venice Commission has said on different occasions. And uh, the uh, the parties uh, should stay all in the parliament and discuss the issues there. And the cooperation and the seeking compromises and consensus on such major issues uh, that is, shows whether the government that is in charge primarily, whether they mean it uh, when they say uh, they want the reform to proceed, that doesn't go, such important things don't go with one party. That must go broader and that is the appeal um, uh, and um, I'm not now speculating about uh, the Saakashvili case uh, yeah, uh, Marina described it correctly any call for uh, for mass uh, demonstrations did not produce this effect that so that should be a signal indeed and uh, uh, UNM uh, in the percentage I think can be relatively uh, satisfied and still if they want to um, be part of the game or become part of the game and on the other side the ruling party that we will see and witness and encourage that there are concrete results of cooperation in the implementation of the necessary reforms that is what what uh, we should uh, talk about and what the citizens expect. The citizens are getting in these typical Georgian political discussions where they lash out at each other, the citizens' view gets out of sight. And uh, that is what they should now concentrate on and deliver on the things that really are interesting for the people. Then that is not whether this or that one has uh, done something right or wrong. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your concise uh, and very clear conclusions. Uh, now I ask uh, Nino and then uh, Corneli, I mean, to uh, end our um, replies uh, and probably our session as well. Uh, so, yes, um, thanks again for the question. Uh, in terms of COVID, uh, I can mention that um, uh, because also last year we had with COVID, really election administration managed uh, to ensure that we people were voting with uh, safety measures and they had uh, really tried for that. So when we see the uh, turnout very high for municipal elections compared to previous, we can say that we managed to conduct elections uh, during the pandemic already second time. So although we had some problems and we had like COVID people who some of them were restricted to vote, but in general to assess, we still managed to uh, conduct elections in very high numbers of pandemic. Uh, as for like political situations, yes, yeah, second round will be very much uh, defined by the developments what will happen now in Georgia, including Mikhail Saakashvili, what we'll, we will see uh, in this um, uh, in this time, because uh, yes, like Saakashvili's issue is boosting voters from both sides. I would say uh, Saakashvili is 
of course, leader of UNM and UNM voters and supporters are more active to vote. But on the other side, those who don't like Saakashvili are going and voting for Georgian Green. So I think Saakashvili's issue just increased polarization in this country and decreased the supporters of smaller political parties. This is my understanding because polarization again uh, rise for those to be political parties. So let's see what the like developments related to Saga Shuli will of course affect the second rounds. Uh, and second rounds are very important, but here like I I'm really recommending all the parties and candidates who are running that at least for the second round to campaign based on the issues what people are expecting from them for these mayoral races and especially in majoritarian districts. So let's see, we will be closely monitoring second round uh, developments and of course informing you what will be our observations. Thank you. Very Thank much. you, Nino. Thank you be very, yes. uh, very shortly, just, uh, uh, you know, just to sum up about uh, the second part of this question is that major problem we are facing, which also affects also the Saakashvili situation, is that none of the political parties, neither GD or the UNM, doesn't believe that there's another part of the electorate which supports them. They just don't want to accept that, you know, this is the reality. The people actually voted for diversity and they need to work together, even though they don't like or they hate each other, something. And I think this unacceptance and this zero-sum mentality is a major uh, problem uh, why we have, uh, I would say, this uh, crisis in Georgia. So basically there's a, uh, a, some sort of expectation from both sides that another side will disappear. This is not going to happen because in the Georgian, not the, uh, you know, uh, Georgians are different. They have different um, ideas. They support different, uh, you know, like parties and political leaders. So I think if we don't realize this, I, I think we will end up again with this, uh, even after uh, sooner or later, Georgian dream will lose the election. But we, my fear is that if we not change the attitudes towards the politics and towards the uh, something, we may end up uh, again after 10 years and we may be again talking about the same points with different actors to be as a ruling party. And I think this is a major concern for Georgia. Thank you, Corneli. I thank you all, uh, uh, all the speakers, all, all the participants. Look, I mean, I, I might be summarizing our discussion as uh, following. Uh, there was no uh, election progress uh, or election conduct progress in, in Georgia, as uh, been mentioned by many, many speakers. Secondly, Georgian problems must be solved by Georgia and in Georgia. This is, again, so important. And finally, finally, I have to admit that um, this coalition building mentality, many times mentioned by all is something so important on what we, we might focus in future in, in our dealings and in, in our uh, cooperation. So I thank you all, Nino, Corneli, Marina, and Mikhail for your uh, presentations, for your replies, participation. I'm looking forward, and you know, I mean, April 19 agreement is valid, and we will cooperate with uh, Georgia accordingly. So we wish uh, you all, I mean, uh, all the best uh, and we will observe second round of elections and see you next time as well in different uh, um, um, undertakings we will be involved. Thank you. Bye-bye.